I'd just finished writing my first novel, Grotesque, which was a really cathartic process that brought out a lot of memories and stirred up some philosophical questions that had been marinating in my mind for a number of years. And so my new novel, The World Beyond Our Knowing, was almost an attempt to answer or reconcile some of these questions, the main one being the big question that most philosophers have attempted to answer at one point or another in the course of their careers. Who am I? I'd begun to travel the world a lot more, and I'd met a lot of people who seemed to have that sense of wanting to find themselves about them, of not knowing who they were or why they existed. Yeah, of course it's one of those old clichés, but it's also a question that's profoundly impacted by the sense of loneliness and alienation that travel can inspire. For all its majesty and adventure, there's a dark side to freeing an identity so linked to where we are from and who we know. When you're on your own, you can pretty much be anyone you want to be. Which you do you want to be today? Is there even one true self, or are we many selves that exist within a number of realities depending on which social situation we're in? When you travel, you encounter any number of new people, each with their own sense of identity, pulling you toward new ways of thinking, by either adopting or rejecting ideas they present to you. I knew that I wanted to write something with a historical context, and was interested in the Crimean War at the time, diving into documentaries and non-fiction, and recalling my time studying philosophy at university. I started jotting down thoughts and researching esotericism, religious pluralism, and perennialism, and considered the possibility of our identities changing depending on where we are in the world at any given moment, of how we interpret knowledge and religions to make a version of ourselves that fits how we feel. The Victorian age in particular was a time of great development across the globe, with technologies enabling travel and correspondence to and from the other side of the world. As a result, travellers and writers brought with them new ways of thinking from the countries they visited and the religions they encountered. And a number of new philosophies were born from the attempt to understand and come to terms with this clash of cultures and beliefs. Religious pluralism holds that various world religions are limited by their distinctive historical and cultural contexts, and thus there is no single true religion. There are only many equally valid religions. Each religion, a direct result of humanity's attempt to grasp and understand the incomprehensible divine reality. And by the same token, esotericism is a metaphysical concept referring to a supposed transcendent unity of all great religious traditions. Esotericism is the metaphysical point of unity where exoteric religions are believed to converge. Of course, many religions reacted strongly to this new influence of beliefs from faraway lands, and religious persecution and threat of heresy drove a number of thinkers and philosophers to either hide their ideas within the religions of their time or simply go underground, leading to the creation of occultism, meaning clandestine or hidden secret. When I began to create characters for the story, I came to realise that I couldn't just have one central character who undergoes a powerful change, because I wanted to look at these characters as a sort of study into nature versus nurture. And in order to do that, I needed to have two opposing characters who were as similar in nature as humans can be. Twins. So now you've got two people who have been raised in a similar environment, had the same opportunity to be influenced by others, and who eventually diverge into what is known as the right and left hand path. The right hand path is seen as a definition for those that follow specific ethical codes and adopt social convention, while the left hand path adopts the opposite attitude, espousing the breaking of taboo and the abandoning of set morality. Lawrence, the right hand path, and Nathaniel, the left. And so now we have our two central characters who have diverged apart from one another and can represent the struggle to come to understand one another, much like societies have struggled to understand and accept one another throughout time. Nathaniel's education leads him toward Gnosticism, commonly understood as a knowledge or insight into humanity's real nature as divine, 
leading to the deliverance of the divine spark within humanity from the constraints of earthly existence. Attempting to know himself at the deepest level so that he can ultimately know God. And yet in doing so, he abandons the notion of God in favour of himself, manifesting himself as a divine being and ultimately finding nothing that he did not already know. In reality, he's a Morosoff, a would-be philosopher, a fool, who thinks he is cleverer than he really is. Lawrence, on the other hand, is the sum of events in his life which have taught him an appreciation of all things, and throughout the novel we see him questioning his Christian beliefs in favour of panpsychism, his experiences leading him to see the world as a living and breathing being. Panpsychism holds that the mind is a fundamental feature of the world which exists throughout the universe. Panpsychists suggest that the type of mentality we know through our own experience is present in some form in a wide range of natural bodies. Some historical and non-Western panpsychists ascribe attitudes such as life or spirits to all entities. Others ascribe a more primitive form of mentality to things such as rocks or buildings that fall short of sentience. As plot lines within the novel develop, we see both brothers become involved in an organisation called The Collective. Some would call them a cult, but they're much more than that. It's true that they have a number of traits that would suggest they're a cult. Devotion to a cause, members acting in secret away from the eyes of the public, etc. But The Collective is an ancient organisation that has managed to remain hidden from societies by their ability to control knowledge and power. Consider them to be the gatekeepers of everything. They're always two steps ahead of everyone else. And this concept is inspired by a philosophy founded in the early 20th century by esotericist Rudolf Steiner called Anthroposophy. Anthroposophy postulates the existence of an objective, intellectually comprehensible spiritual world which is accessible to human experience. Followers of Anthroposophy aim to develop mental faculties of spiritual discovery through a mode of thought independent of sensory experience. They also aim to present their ideas in a manner verifiable by rational discourse and specifically seek a precision and clarity in studying the spiritual world mirroring that obtained by scientists investigating the physical world. The Collective have developed methods to access this spiritual realm mainly through the use of entheogens, drugs, and ritualistic practices. There are a few concepts I particularly liked during my research, the first being the Akashic Records, a compendium of all universal events, thoughts, words, emotions, and intent ever to have occurred in the past, present, or future in terms of all entities and life forms, not just human. They're believed by theosophists to be encoded in a non-physical plane of existence, known as the mental plane. It's believed all thoughts, words, intent, etc. generate its own unique frequency or vibration which is stored in the Akashic Records. And the second being the collective unconscious, referring to structures of the unconscious mind which are shared among beings of the same species. The term was coined by Carl Jung. According to Jung, the human collective unconscious is populated by instincts as well as by archetypes. These are universal symbols such as the Great Mother, the Wise Old Man, the Shadow, the Tower, Water and the Tree of Life. All of these archetypes appear in some form or another within the book, but you'll have to read the book to discover which character embodies each concept. There are so many philosophies within the novel, I'd love to go into more, and if that's something you'd like to see then let me know in the comments below. But we'd be here all day talking about concepts like Rosicrucianism, the Ouroboros, Animism, Buddhism, alchemic studies across the Arabic and Asian worlds, even quantum biology, which is something I delved into within the research into poisons and entheogens. If you'd like to look into any of those, then I'll drop some links into the comments section and you can have further study or simply read the novel and compare notes. I guess my final thought, the one I'd like to leave you with, is something that I found whilst writing the novel. And that is, stop trying to find yourself. There's nothing to find. 
because you are you in a moment. Something new inevitably comes along and changes who we are, and that's uncontrollable. Things like world-changing events, love, new ways of thinking and discoveries, they fundamentally change who we are on a daily basis, and so the concept of finding oneself is completely pointless. Much better just go with the flow and accept who you are that day. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed delving into the philosophy behind the novel with me. Let me know what you thought and be sure to share the video. Thanks for watching.